Good morning, everyone. We are um, going to start the webinar in two minutes. meeting to order this morning on January 24th at 11.20. Sorry for our late start this morning, everyone. And before the meeting gets started, I'd like to ask our board liaison to review the meeting procedures and protocols. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. I am Terry Lucas, the board liaison at Calbray College. You can follow our meeting agenda on board docs, which the link can be found on our website, calbright.org forward slash board. For attendees who wish to make public comment, please use the Q&A feature to address the board for up to three minutes. Public comment should be used to address today's agenda. A reminder that this board meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Thank you. With that, will you please call the roll? Hildegard Aguinaldo. Darius Anderson. Amy Costa. Here. Joshua Elizondo. Here. Kevin Hull. Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis. Present. And, and, and pr present. Sorry, it's Kevin Hall. Present. Thank you, Kevin. Apologies. Paul Medina. Jennifer Perry. Tom Epstein. Here. Alicia Escobar Carrillo. Here. Jolena Grande. Pamela Haynes. Bill Rawlings. Present. Roy Shabazian. Here. Valerie Shaw. Los Villa Lobos. Here. Joseph Williams. And Paul Medina. Present here. Thank you. We have a quorum, President great, Costa. Great, thank you. I know we have some um, other members who will be joining us a little bit later. And as they do, uh, we'll, we'll call that out for you uh, to the and board liaison. Madam Chair, Darius Anderson just joined. Great, thank you. Uh, can you please note that uh, board mm -hmm. member Anderson is with us as well. Uh, now with that, we'd like to proceed with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask Trustee Elizondo to please lead us in the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, our next item 1.3 is discussion of the order of the agenda. Do any of the board members have uh, any requests on the order of the agenda before us this morning? <coughs> okay, I'm not seeing any. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to myself, I guess, for the report. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I, I will just say yesterday when I was presiding over our Board of Governors meeting, I noted um, you know, that we had a mass shooting in California uh, in Monterey Park. And before we even ended our meeting, we had another one in Half Moon Bay, uh, much closer to my home. Uh, and I also read where there was a um, uh, group shooting in Oakland. Um, and, you know, yesterday I said, and, you know, I kind of commiserated uh, with some of my colleagues. And I know California actually has some of the, the most progressive laws um, and you know there've been some, some court issues, um, but my hope is, and I know some of the policymakers across the street have already kind of made public comments um, about pursuing other policies, but this just has got to stop. I mean, it's just absolutely unconscionable in my mind that people cannot live their daily lives without fearing for their safety. Um, and the fact that my own children, my three children, have all been involved in active shooting drills at their school. 
um, is really a sad statement of where we are as a society, frankly. Um, I had earthquake dwells and all of that. The fact that we have to teach our kids to run and protect themselves um, from violence at their school um, and that we cannot really give them assurances that they're safe even in public um, is really a damning condemnation of our society as a whole. Um, sorry, it couldn't be on a more pleasant note, but I think it's something that we all need to think about and do our parts to change. Um, with that, I will turn it over to uh, our CEO for her report. Thank you, President Costa. I appreciate the perspectives. Thank you, President Costa, Vice President Aguinaldo, and members of the Board of Trustees. And change tone a little bit and wish us all a happy new year. Um, and I hope that each of you had a wonderful holiday season with family. As we reflect on the past 12 months and our vision for the future, I'm actually reminded of the words of William Blake, who said, what is now proved was only once imagined. Every new year brings with us with it the cliche of restarting and beginning <coughs> anew. But here at Calwright, our intent is actually to keep building on the success of 2022 and to continue to accelerate toward the end of the fiscal year. This year, we continue to complete key recommendations by the state auditor and remain on track for those that have multi-year deadlines. We also more than doubled our enrollments as well as the number of certificates awarded compared to 2021. We're approaching a student body of 2,000 students and are positioned to award our 200th certificate later this month. But more importantly than even that is that we are doing so by effectively reaching the pop populations and the communities that we were built to serve. <clears throat> our student engagement metrics continue to increase as we test and refine and improve. Time to completion for our students was cut in half this year. And we have now seen multiple quarters in which our student persistence rate exceeds 90%. There is more to do and there will always be more to do, but this is exceptional progress that reflects CalBright's role as the leading edge of the learning curve for serving non-traditional learners and for building a new model of education within the higher education sector. We immerse ourselves in this effort. So sometimes it's really important for us to take a step back and to remember the greater context in which we commit ourselves to this work. Across the California community college system, students who are 25 years or older have a 5% three-year completion rate for chancellor's, chancellor's Office approved certificate programs. For associate's degrees, <clears throat> that number is even, that percentage is even lower. And this is especially acute for students of color and those from underrepresented communities in higher education. Amidst a period in which California community colleges experienced a 300,000 drop in the number of students, non-traditional learners left at some of the highest rates. These statistics are sobering, and they're also actually in line with what we see in terms of national averages. They also tell a story of this moment and the reality that our learners are confronting across the country and in California. The harsh reality that the conventional way of doing things isn't set up to serve adult learners well. Rarely are non-traditional students <clears throat> the recipients of data-driven, outcome-focused endeavors to nurture their success. Rarely do efforts focus first from the perspective of the adult learner and apply the best of what can be learned when we actively listen and observe, build and test academic and support solutions with equity community needs at the center. It's in this context that we shine a bright light that's important to celebrate. Calbright's accomplishments and the success of our students actually remind us of what is possible when we recognize and respond to the realities that our learners face in a fast changing economy. The new year also brings with it the state's next budget cycle. Again, we're extraordinarily thankful for the support in the governor's budget and excited to see our efforts aligned with the core priorities of the state that are focused on supporting economic and workforce outcomes, particularly in key regions of the state. And again, despite progress, we expect a vocal minority to create political headwinds for us. But our work in progress demonstrate the deep need we have as a state to place greater emphasis and support and focus on supporting adult learners. And the purpose of our model of education is to build it around their needs. We're seeing growth as a college relative to other institutions. Our 5X growth of the past two academic years it's actually precisely because our focused efforts to effectively reach and support learners otherwise left behind. And our student persistence rate is nearly double system-wide average for our community of learners. 
despite that undeniable progress, <clears throat> I think what's especially been disheartening has been the misleading arguments against Calbright and the effect that they have in trying to discredit our students who are making this very vulnerable choice to come back to education, who come to us committed, excited to learn, and making the challenging effort to fit their studies into a day that is likely already maxed out with childcare, elder care, working. To remember at a time when the system wide, in system wide, we see the completion rate for non traditional students around 5%, Calvert is often asked to meet a standard that seems to apply nowhere else. A standard that carries no consideration for our seven year startup period, no room for learning and improvement, which are the essential conditions for actually meeting the needs of our learners in these difficult times that students find themselves in. No room for understanding that enrollment won't return to pre pandemic levels and intractably low completion, print, completion rates won't rise if higher education continues with business as usual. Unlike other areas and in many other areas of higher ed, we're seeing real progress and momentum at Calbright when it comes to serving our community of learners. Our funding, relatively, it's nominal compared to what's being spent across the system, yet we still have aggressive naysayers and opponents who spread misinformation in an attempt to devalue our students and this essential work for the communities that are too often forgotten. This baffling cycle commands significant time as we work twice as hard to meet a barrage of requests while also supporting our students and continuing to build this college. No other community college is, is asked to do this. But today, you'll see this progress in our meeting and on future agendas as we stay focused on our mission and the mandates outlined in our founding legislation. We're very excited to share with you research this morning regarding new programs and their opportunity to support adults across the state. I'm also thrilled to seek your approval for several new candidates as we continue to build the team that will drive our growth and success. And we know, and now we can show, that when we are provided the space and opportunity to build, we have the ability to make fast and consistent progress. And I look forward to continue to share that progress with you each month as we work together to tackle equity and strengthen outcomes across our community college system. And a special thanks to President Costa. This now concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, uh, appreciate it. Um, I'd like to note for the board liaison that we have board member Haynes with us. Um, with that, the board will now move into closed session. We have uh, two items on our agenda and we expect we'll be back from closed session in about 30 minutes. Thank you so much. Closed session is in the same room as yesterday. <clears throat> down the hall around the corner.
Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, the board did not take uh, any action in closed session that is reportable. Um, with that, I'm going to move on to our consent agenda, which is in section three of today's agenda. Do any trustees wish to remove any item from the consent agenda for discussion or a separate vote? I am not seeing any. Uh, with that, do we have any public comment on this item? There is no public comment, President Costa. Great, with that, colleagues, I am open to taking a motion. Move to approve the um, Haynes with the motion. Second. At the sign with a second. With that, can you please uh, call the roll? Heldegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Daria Sanderson. Yes. Amy Costa. Aye. Kevin Hull. Aye. Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis. Paul Medina. Josh Elizondo. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Felicia. Jolina Grande. Pamela Haynes. Aye. Jennifer Perry. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. Valerie Shaw. Los Villa Lobos. Yes. Joseph Williams. We have motion carries president costa great thank you so much uh next we're going to move into so the i'm sorry this is felicia um oh, uh, escobar Carrillo. i'm sorry i did not i could not get myself off mute i just wanted to note i am also yes great and here's the here's the problem too. uh board member uh or trustee medina excuse me i need oh. my vernacular right we just uh, voted on um uh consent. the consent agenda Yes. Um, would you like to uh, officially log your vote? Um, that's an I. There's nothing for anything. Go we'll for it. Okay. As a whole. Great. Um, that will be noted by uh, the liaison. Uh, next up uh, in our action uh, agenda portion, uh, we have item 4.1. We have our new general counsel, uh, Leticia Ramirez, presenting. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Costa, Vice President Aguinaldo, and members of the board. For the record, um, this is Leticia Ramirez, General Counsel. This is my first meeting uh, with the board, and I'm very excited to be here. Um, so now on to the business at hand. Before you today is an item seeking approval of an amendment to a legal services agreement with the law firm of Fagan, Friedman, and Full Frost, known as F3. The proposed amendment would retroactively extend the term of the agreement from June 30th, 2020 to June 30th, 2023. Approving this amendment would ratify the past payment of invoices under the contract, which expired in June 2020, and would allow the college to continue to receive legal services from F3 for the remainder of this fiscal year as I evaluate the college's legal needs and issue a request for proposals for outside legal counsel services this spring. I'll start with some background on the agreement. F3 was selected as outside counsel following a competitive selection process, an RFP process conducted by the Chancellor's Office and the Foundation for California Community Colleges in 2018. The RFP solicited legal services to advise and support the formation and operation of Calbright. Following that process, Calbright and F3 executed a two-year legal services agreement in August of 2018. Since then, F3 has served as the main legal advisor to the college. I want to note that the agreement contained hourly rates for associates and partners. However, it did not specify a not to exceed um, the total or annual amount. F3 has provided general counsel and specialized legal services to Calbright. They advise on a range of novel and complex legal matters relating to procurement, employment, and partnerships. Addresses, addressing these matters um, requires in-depth research, original drafting, and cross-functional collaboration with all aspects of the college. F3 has been a key partner in advancing and meeting the timelines and goals in Calvary's strategic vision plan. 
and expenditures for legal services for the past four fiscal years have totaled about $2 million. Now I'll talk about why this item is before the board. We're here because in October of 2022, Calbright identified that the term of F3's agreement had expired and had not been formally extended by board action. As the board is aware, since 2021, Calbright has been diligent in enhancing its procurement and contracting processes, including hiring a full-time procurement coordinator, updating a procurement contracting and handbook, and also um, conducting trainings for staff. It was through these processes that um, this issue was identified. Since then, Calbright has paused the processing of F3's pending invoices until the board takes formal action to extend the term of the agreement. This was, of course, communicated to F3, and they understood the need to do so. In light of this, F3 also agreed to discount the pending invoices. So the total amount pending is approximately $74,000. In response to this development, Calbright's procurement coordinator is conducting a comprehensive review of the status of all contracts procured on behalf of Calbright during fiscal, year, fiscal years 2018-19 and 2019-20 to ensure that all of our contracts are up to date. We anticipate that this is an isolated case because the contract was procured prior to the current Calbright administration being in place. The amendment before <coughs> the board only modifies a provision relating to the term of the agreement. All other provisions, including hourly rates, remain the same. Lastly, um, since joining Calbright last month, I have begun to evaluate and assess Calbright's needs as it pertains to eligible <coughs> counsel. And um, one of my top priorities is to issue the RFP for new um, outside legal counsel services based on um, our current needs um, this spring. So I'll be returning to the board later on this fiscal year. This concludes my report and um, I, along with President Menon, can answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much with that. Colleagues, uh, any questions or comments? I am not seeing any from the board, but that is there any public comment for this item? There is no public comment, President yeah. Costa. Thank you so much with that, colleagues. I will uh, entertain a motion in a second. So moved. Uh, I've got Epstein with a move, and I've second. got Medina with a second. Uh, Medina beat you on the second, sorry. <laughs> right. With that, can you please call the roll? Hildegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Gary's Anderson. Yes. Amy Costa. Aye. Josh Elizondo. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Felicia Escobar Carrillo. Aye. Jolina Grande. Kevin Hull. Aye. Paul Medina. Aye. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. Valerie Shaw. Pamela Haynes. Aye. Los Villa Lobos. Yes. Motion carries, President Costa. Thank you so much. Thanks for your presentation. Next up, we have item 4.2, which is the Vice President of Engineering. Good afternoon, President Costa um, and Vice President Aguinaldo, members of the board. I'm just so pleased to bring Brendan Volheim's candidacy forward to you today for consideration as our next Vice President of Engineering. Brendan has spent the last 12 years working in various levels of big and small technology companies. Most recently has worked as the Chief Technology Officer at UNO, you know, a data science company, providing data insights to universities, publishing companies, and financial institutions worldwide. He's maintained a 20 person engineering team while helping the company reduce costs and reprioritize procedures. Before you know, he worked at Zynga, an online gaming company supporting millions of daily active users on their various games. In his spare time, he enjoys playing ice hockey, golfing and camping with his family. And again, I'm just so happy to bring Brendan's candidacy forward today for your consideration and approval. Thank you so very much. Uh, colleagues, is there any uh, trustee discussion on this item? Seeing that, I will ask if there's any public comment on this item. There is no public comment, President Costa. Thank you so much for that, colleagues. I will entertain a motion and a second. Move approval. I have second. to use the movement and Bill Rawlings with a second. 
With that, can you please call the roll? Heldegard Aguinaldo. Aye. Gary Sanderson. Yes. Amy Costa. Aye. Josh Elizondo. Aye. Kevin Hull. Aye. Paul Medina. Aye. Tom Epstein. Aye. Alicia Escobar Carrillo. Aye. Dolina Grande. <coughs> Pamela Haynes. Aye. Bill Rawlings. Aye. Roy Shabazian. Yes. From Las Villa Lobos. Yes. Motion carries. President Costa. Uh, we'll now move on to our information and reports items. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Younger up uh, to give us uh, a report on labor market insights. I love these reports because I hear about professions I never knew existed. Um, I'm dating myself, clearly. With that, take it away. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good good afternoon, uh, Costa, Vice President. I'm excited to be before you today to preview uh, labor market insights supporting our intention to develop uh, two new programs here at uh, Calbyte. Uh, one being the user experience uh, and user interface, also known as UXUI, um, an expansion of our recently uh, announced design innovation occupational cluster, uh, and then also a project management program, which is an expansion of our existing uh, knowledge economy occupational cluster. Uh, you recall during our March 2022. A board of Trustees a study session, Calvert introduced a, a workforce-driven equity-centered uh, community design framework for program research, selection, and development. Uh, in alignment with that strategy, and prior to moving forward with program <laughs> development, uh, we have committed to providing this board with a preview of our research and findings to support new program selection. So therefore, today, uh, we'll uh, review Calvert's research and development phase, which consists of a comprehensive labor market uh, information deep dive. Next slide. Just as it relates to our roadmap, um, providing a research overview today, comprehensive statewide career scan, labor market insights uh, as well. Slide three, next slide. So our research process uh, starts with the end of mind, uh, right? And as we evaluate uh, the opportunity to introduce new programs to our adult learner population, uh, we really focus on solving for what currently does not work for people in the education as well as the employer marketplace. Our process is cyclical, um, starting with discovery, uh, moving on to synthesis, and then finally with co-creation. Next slide. During discovery, we really engage strategic research partners and perform in-depth informational uh, interviews with industry subject matter experts, managers, and incumbents. Uh, we leverage advisory councils and industry partners to validate the skills, knowledge, and experience needed uh, to perform successfully uh, in the role. Uh, during synthesis, we schedule follow-up interviews as needed to gain in-depth analysis uh, of the job skills identified during the discovery phase. And finally, during co-creation, uh, our faculty subject matter experts, uh, instruction, instructional designers, and the curriculum committee uh, define curriculum and wraparound <coughs> services teams define and design key services to support our students. Next slide. Uh, for illustrative purposes, we brought back this side uh, slide in a, in a couple of different settings, uh, but it really highlights the, the filtering action uh, through the lens of the <coughs> archetypal learner, uh, Brenda. Uh, as we know, Brenda it, it has a number of responsibilities outside of just pursuing higher education, right? Um, single parent, um, you know, caregiver um, to a family, but also managing uh, low wage jobs, right? And so uh, therefore she looks at uh, this opportunity of higher education in a non-traditional way. And as a uh, institution, uh, right, we really focus on that, that non-traditional uh, element uh, to bring forward opportunity uh, for a Brenda, right? So she filters out things like jobs with uh, credential and formal education requirements, uh, jobs with median pay below 32,000 and offering no on the job uh, training or career development opportunities and jobs that are primarily uh, just managerial, right? Uh, they, these are the, <clears throat> excuse me, inputs that we have to consider as we're developing our, our programs. Um, and then this type of filtering through the lens of our adult learners <coughs> informs not only uh, our program selection strategy, but it also allows us to categorize our current and future programs into what we're calling occupational clusters to meet our student needs. Next slide. So, so here you'll see uh, a listing of our current categorization or occupational clusters. 
Uh, we'll be focusing on uh, two specifically today, the bottom left, uh, the design innovation, uh, which will house our UX UI or our user experience, user interface program. Uh, and then the top right, uh, the knowledge economy occupational cluster, uh, which will uh, host our project management program. Next slide. <clears throat> So I'd like to spend a moment just sharing market data uh, and insights uh, for future for our future user experience and interface uh, program. Next slide. The user experience and uh, user interface professionals really bridge the gap between people, design, and technology, and enable users to leverage complex technical products in a user-friendly manner. Given that uh, consumer habits and expectations are evolving, uh, there's a strong desire by industry. Uh, to really deepen the communication-centric experiences and create innovative um, you know, opportunities and appealing interfaces to really meet the consumer basis needs. So the demand for these careers is on the rise, uh, and it is estimated by 2027, jobs in this space will grow approximately 13%, uh, with nearly 17,300 jobs added in California, and lending the profession to meaningful job security. Next slide. Uh, this map really highlights the uh, regions and counties uh, in California uh, that, that offer a number of job openings um, and the darker shades really represent that higher volume of jobs. Uh, while it is important to understand kind of where the jobs are located, uh, we also know that the opportunity does not always have to be where the jobs are located, but where there are large populations of individuals who want to be trained but do not have access to the right training opportunities. So we see this opportunity specifically um, for UX UI, uh, you know, uh, deep opportunities in Los Angeles, San Diego, Inland Empire, as well as the Bay Area, um, you know, where there is uh, ample opportunity as well as a population to be served. Next slide. Next slide, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, and so as it relates to employment opportunity, there are nearly uh, 20,000 jobs for USUI designers in California with a median salary ranges between 69,000 and 86,000. Um, however, in the state of California, uh, only uh, 2,700 or so certificates are earned annually uh, from programs that specifically train for this occupation. What does that mean? That means it's a great opportunity, right? So that's nearly a seven to one job posting to certificate earning ratio right across the entire state and nearly four to one ratio in focus regions. And so we, we, we really do have a, a great opportunity uh, to uh, stand up opportunities for, for this population. Next slide. So as you, as you can see, uh, there are common skills across multiple entry level occupations with career pathways. So skills like uh, user research and marketing and visual design are highly transferable and lead to a number of top occupations like user experience designer or interaction designer alike. Uh, next slide. So with only 16.7% of incumbents uh, identifying as Hispanic uh, and 3.4% identifying as Black or African American, Calbright programming presents a unique opportunity to not only expose our students to emerging careers and quality jobs, but also assist with diversifying the industry, giving our unique student demographics. Next slide. So moving on to the next uh, program we would like to develop, uh, which is pro uh, project management. Uh, this exciting program will expand the offerings in our knowledge economy occupational cluster and will bring together foundational project management knowledge. Uh, our students will gain a better understanding of the various elements of business delivery and differentiate themselves when competing for the next entry level position in project management. Next slide. Project management is a unique career field uh, that involves numerous skills that are highly transferable across industry and sectors. So due to increasing reliance on project oriented strategies to meet economic demands, entry level project managers have become essential part of business strategic planning efforts. So project management skills such as time and cost management, planning and problem solving are critical ensuring to ensure organizational success. And it is estimated that in the next 10 years, the project management occupation will grow nearly 10 to 15% adding as many as 19,900 jobs in California. Next slide. So the regional outlook for project management is promising, 
right? The darker shades of blue indicate the higher values of the jobs. And we see that in Los Angeles, San Diego, Inland Empire, Central Valley, Fresno, Kern, uh, and Bay Area are really, uh, you know, regions uh, that have a substantial amount of opportunities uh, that also have um, very large populations as well. Next slide. As it relates to employment opportunity, uh, there are nearly 98,500 jobs for project management uh, in California with median salary ranges between 44 and 73,000. Um, however, in the state uh, of California, um, only 5,600 or so certificates are earned annually uh, and uh, for specifically programs in this occupation. Uh, again, nearly a 17 to one job posting to earning ratio across the state and 10 to one ratio in our focus regions. Again, highlighting the opportunity we have. Uh, next slide. And as you can see here, uh, there are common skills across multiple entry level occupations with career pathways uh, within it, many industries. Uh, workflow management and planning skills in industries like manufacturing or systems design can lead to careers as project management specialists or, or business operations assistant, for example. Next slide. So like many other occupations, diversity in the workforce is an opportunity uh, we evaluate closely. Uh, with only 5.1% of incumbents identifying as Black or African American, Calbright programming can expose these students uh, to the emerging <clears throat> careers, uh, while also at the same time diversifying the talent pool. So this is an opportunity to ensure these entry-level project management roles serve as gateways uh, to broader project management field, where increasing levels of responsibility an opportunity uh, may exist. So with that, I'm happy to take uh, your questions at this time. Thank you so much. Colleagues, any other questions or comments? Can we take down the PowerPoint so I can see um, if any of the virtual participants have? Thank you. So I did have a question, but I've got to remember it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I do have a question, and it really goes to if you can um, help me understand um, how you go about sort of process. This is the process because how you go about identifying these emerging jobs, and then uh, and what con and what. And what um, and what that team looks like because you mentioned the faculty subject matter experts. Um, I suspect that that's not the only person who's doing this. There's a team with different skills. If you'll ex explain sort of what happens, who talks to who, and how does that happen? You know, it's a it's a great question, um, Member Haynes. And so what I would say is it's cross collaborative effort. It's not just a workforce function, but it's an all of institution function. And so it starts with our workforce team and the discovery and engaging with both uh, employers, um, community organizations, um, and, and better understanding the labor market information um, based on region. Uh, so it'll start there, but it progresses with leveraging the skills uh, in-house uh, from learning and instruction to career uh, ser services and success uh, and to making sure that uh, both our uh, assigned committees and teams are cross-collaborative and leveraging the information available. So in addition to research and development, we also uh, do the qualitative assessments and, and reaching out to current incumbents, subject matter ex experts in industry uh, as well to take into account. And from an emerging careers perspective, we leverage uh, a lot of different uh, tools and systems inclusive of our statewide tools and employment and the employment development agency, the labor market. Uh, information tools, but more broadly looking at uh, regional applications that allow us to specify where the opportunity exists uh, throughout California. So this is, this is um, I'm just sort of talking out loud. I'm not really expecting you to, to dive into this question. Um, we, we, our sister colleges, I'm certain, um, have partnerships as well. Um, but I don't hear anybody, and maybe I'm not in the same room, I know I'm not in the same room, about where these emerging jobs are. Um, and, so, but I'm really hoping that that is sort of, it's happening. I mean, I know that places like San Diego, where there's an industry that's there, that's embedded, that didn't just happen, it's been emerging over the last 20, 30 years. Um, that becomes an incubator. But 
for that map that you had where it is the Imperial Bat Valley. Yes. Um, the, the map that um, are sort of the light blues where it's the Central Valley. Um, that's where the there's that's where the challenges truly are. And they don't necessarily have the infrastructure, but they do have community colleges. Okay, but, but putting that aside, they don't have the infrastructure. So given that piece, um, and I realize that there are fewer jobs in that area, they're going for, but there are some big cities. So how do you, how do you bridge that piece of it? Um, because if indeed um, these are jobs where you don't have to move, then you do have populations that really would benefit um, if you could train them in a way that it ends up being more than the 240 jobs. I mean, LA is, is always, the LA County is always the big gorilla. But if indeed we're really about our mission relative to those areas of the state that, that really don't have what they need in order to thrive, what I would, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of answering my own question. Kern County Community College District is doing bang up stuff. Yeah. Okay, so um, so I'm hoping yes. while Calbright is doing this, that it's, it's gathering partners around that. Okay. If I, if I may, absolutely. if I may, um, you're absolutely right, spot on, right? So this is what uh, President Men uh, speaks about often. Uh, and not just encourages us, but we're on the ground developing and forging those partnerships when you talked about um, kind of the Central Valley, making sure that we both understand how the economies are different by region, right? Um, but also engaging with community college partners, um, CBOs on the grounds, community-based organizations and others. And we're often, you know, asked to be a great convener because as a statewide community college, we have that awesome opportunity uh, and something that we value. Uh, and our commitment is to bring folks together um, to produce opportunity and actually share that information so everyone's been brought along in the state and amongst our peer group as well. So I appreciate you identifying that and that's that's always a top one for our priority. So, so, and I will end this by, by saying something that's critically important. There are some regions in the in the state that are doing that. They, they have a collaboration. So San Diego's one where it's not just um, San Diego um, a Community College District. There's some other sub places where they they have built that collaboration where they're working together in, in, for the common goal. Kern is one of those as well, and you can see it in the numbers and in the and the the data of, of who they're trying to get into these jobs, how, who's coming through their system. Um, it would be helpful, um, at, at least as a sort of a touch point. Um, um, where is that needed in other places? Uh, you know, how I, I, I've been in, in Los Rios for 23 years and I know that there's a collaboration. I don't know how well they're doing. Yeah, I really don't um, because, you know, talk is cheap. The reality is, are, 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 there, are, are they looking at these new jobs and are they planning for them? And are they working among this conglomerate of folks on these particular things, and not just the same old, same old. That's great, but we really need, we need for, and we need to figure out how to get our students into those into those things. So I'm just talking out loud about a much broader statewide perspective. Can, but great can job. I, can I jump in? Yeah. One thing that's I think useful for us to realize or think about it is the historic models for incentivizing the development of workforce programs are uh, siloed and mm -hmm. very myopic. Topic, right, they yes. look at industry verticals, yep. and our, and our institutions are typically organized that way as well in higher education. It's not just a California community college thing more broadly, but what's the the reason what we're doing is interesting is not just because of where we're showing up to do it, because we'll go where the populations need and require mm -hmm. us to do, but it is also very much you know we get asked often like, what's your employer engagement model? You know, what is your mm -hmm, uh, model mm -hmm. for program management? And, and the reality is, is that those are the areas of innovation that are exportable for what we do. So what we're, you know, this process that we keep bringing back to the board where we first talk about the labor market context and conditions for the application of a potential new program, and then the process of actually developing it at the next stage and gate, which involves deeper, deeper engagement with the local context or the regional context of what we're doing, 
um, those are not necessarily just singular institutions, but as Michael mentioned, those, those are all the dimensions of the community, including economic development, which we didn't emphasize, but plays an important mm -hmm. role. So we can understand how do we actually not just isolate to a single vertical, yeah. because the local colleges actually do that extraordinarily well in many places. And, and we always love to hear about that. Like you mentioned Kern, and, mm -hmm, and, and that's mm -hmm. one that I'm um, especially excited about. San Diego Continuing Extension has a great new president, Dr. King, who is a, a remarkable individual who we've met with. So all of these places are, are doing these exciting things in these contexts. But this evolution of an approach and a model that's population responsive, that also then ties in <laughs> new ways of growing and developing the analytic side of how we view the labor part of the economy, the market part of the economy, that's where we're innovating. And so what's, what's really, I don't have a better word for fun about this work and, and exciting about this work is when we talk about occupational clusters, it's to move us away from the typical view, which is industry ladders, right? Career ladders, mm -hmm. sector mm -hmm. ladders. And rather to sort of say that's actually not the way the economy is currently organized. And then we have to look at the, that both from the dimension of what the skills are that are required, but then also of this dimension of like, what is the behavior in that hiring market? What do we understand about the things that actually condition employment success? And those are the dimensions of things that we often don't get to look at and don't have methodologies for looking at because we focus maybe on a singular data point. Like we're gonna go with high growth jobs, full stop. We're gonna go with industry relevant jobs, full stop. And so we're not looking at these cross currents in the economy, which is actually the range of motion that a potential applicant can experience in the labor market. And has skill sets yes. that they can go into an, even another industry because they have this, this grouping of, of skill sets. That's right, so as we build our, our our portfolio of, yeah. of available programs, we want to think about it in relation to how the economy is organized, not just the traditional mechanisms with which we have self-organized institutions at a time when our economy functioned very differently. And so what I'm hoping that the, as we move into um, doing this kind of work, Calbright, that um, there's a, there'll be some lessons learned um, because, um, we're talking about this ahead of the curve. Can, and Calbright is probably positioned best, but there may be some, some colleges in their online offerings that, that are, can also position. And part of this is getting that word out, but, it, but it's, meeting, it's meeting those jobs sort of ahead of time, that wave ahead of time and having skilled folks to do it. That's where in many cases we, we have worked behind the curve. We've, you know, we've been doing nursing. We've been doing nursing for the last 10 years, but we were behind the curve doing that. And we, our courses are, were so small, 300 when you need, and there were 5,000 openings. So that's where there's some lessons to be learned on how we do this work that's skill-based, that you can keep on adding those th skills where they, folks can move as the economy moves in these different directions. So I really, it, I'm glad I, I like that. <laughs> Thank you. I have board member absent. Thanks. So, so my question is, I mean, I have, I have to admit, I'm always completely confused by the workforce bureaucracy. Um, whenever the board of governors, you know, there's like eight funding streams and there's consortia mm -hmm. everywhere. And then we, we give out, you know, 30 grants right. to, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you, how do you interact with all that? And, and is there any resentment or is there like a welcoming? Process. I think it's a great question. And so what I would say is we, we take an interesting approach to that. Of one understanding as we're engaging with partners with what the Keeley Seal is, right? And so what's the low hanging fruit? Where do we have opportunity to um, complement the work that's currently been done in, in regions, right? And so when we come to the table, it is a discussion about funding streams long term because we want all of our programs to have longevity. Um, but, but, but we don't make that the central focus. We like to see you know, the, the racy concept of roles and responsibilities, who's doing what and when, right? Because there could be funding streams that exist to support a function. And so let's have that conversation. But more importantly, what is our broader outcome? You know, what are, what are we here for? What are our guiding missions? Uh, and so there, there, there's always been issues, right? I'm, 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 I'm happily, I have been a, an alumni of the Labor and Workforce Development Agency and it's given me great insight 
into being able to parse through some of those challenges. Uh, and so and I think our team being very supportive of that element. And we also have folks all across the college that have been familiar with that at the federal and state level. And so we're fortunate in that in, in terms of being able to come into these discussions with not just a zero focus on, on funding, although it's an important element, let's really talk about what are we trying to accomplish here and over what period of time, not rushing into it and, and being really methodological uh, or, or, or really uh, being precise in terms of what we're trying to accomplish long term. I will say also that um, we don't um, just bend and react to what somebody, what a single qualitative interview might tell us. So often there's a rush to be responsive and the responsive rush means that we develop at an institution a bespoke program, right? There's, uh, we need, I don't know, I can't think of an example right now. Um, and taking that careful intention to map out what the needs are of the region through those conversations helps us to identify what's the contribution to a region that we can make. And we are careful to be very honest when we when we don't think in a program is appropriate for us, right? An over, over specialized program that doesn't actually, you know, focus on the occupational kind of approach or strategy that we have, that's not a good fit for us. And we're honest with the folks at the table who are, are sorting through and trying to solve this problem. So rather than just responding to, I need an acute need for a program of 300 X, we have to say sort of, let us understand a bit more about how your economy is functioning, what your strategy for economic growth is, what areas you anticipate are the most developing and prospecting. Like these are the conversations we're having in the Lodi region and um, in, in that part of outside of outside of Stockton, outside of um, areas where there's uh, nascent industries and economies that are developing, but that we won't, we won't do the specialized training in because that's not going to be a fit for us. But those that growth in industry needs UX designers. It needs folks with marketing skills. It needs, and so those are the kinds of things that we can um, adapt for a region and provide in ways that you know, so that lends a lot to the, or they need IT support, or they need uh, to the way that we think about what makes sense for us and, and how we approach involvement. Like when I always say we go and we listen first, <laughs> it's not a passive listening activity, it's a tactical one. And um, Michael's, you know, lead engineer on that. So, <laughs> so, so they don't see us as Calibrate as a competitor, it's more of a collaborator. Isn't it? I think people do, but I, you know, it just varies, right? In some places, there's so much of a need and a gap between what's happening on the ground and the, you know, and what community members have actual access to in the labor market. So I think you see in some places there's an exciting open arm conversation to sort of say, let's help, you know, come to the table. We have more people involved in figuring this out. That's great. We have great conversations and Kern's a great example of an area where we spend a lot of time. Fresno is an example where we spend a lot of time. Um, but I think in other places, because we're all trained to see it from where we sit, right? So if it is, if I do workforce development, I have just a particular view typically of what my responsibility is directly tied to the funding stream that I'm eligible to receive. So it is, it is always refreshing for folks when we go in, we're not asking for anything except to build and cultivate an understanding of what needs are that are not just at this altitude, but at a, at a little bit of a bigger altitude. So all these things that they have observed over time, but haven't found utility action around, like once we can start to open up those conversations, we find the reception to be warming. So it, I think it's, you know, it's a process, right? It's a, we're doing things not in a way that doesn't look like other institutions have done them typically. And so once we start to explain that, and once you explain the purpose of what we do, um, we have found that to be a really inviting conversation for folks. They get excited about the possibilities. And we're short term too. So we look at it also as a great opportunity yeah, get out. Right, to, to start and then expand your horizons with our uh, sister colleges as well, right? And so we, we oftentimes uh, have to kind of deliver that message to help folks understand kind of the why. Great, thank you. I appreciate the presentation on project management. In the, in the future, we would consider a collaboration. Would you ever thought about um, for, for Calvary College to offer you know, the project management, management professional or any certificate, or, sorry, or certificate in pro, project management designation? Is that like thought or any conversation that's come up? It's a, it's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, 
do that. Um, it, it is a conversation of constant for us when we talk about our programs and working with uh, Dr. McCarty, uh, our learning and instruction vice president. We're pursuing kind of all avenues as it relates to what certifications are most appropriate for our entry level programs. And so uh, I think for, for, for PMP in particular, for the advanced training, but there also is certifications that are entry, it's called um, really project management um, you know, ready. Right, and so that's the, the startup before you get there, right? And so that would also be an exploration in terms of how we consider um, associating ourselves with uh, certifications uh, out there. But a great question, something top of mind. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to public comments. There is no public comment, President Costa. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your report. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have uh, 5.2, reports on contracts and purchases. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, President Costa, Vice President Aguinaldo, and the Board of Trustees. There were eight contracts or amends, amendments executed in December 2022, and a summary of purchases in December 2022, totaling 463365 Great. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, any questions or comments from the board? Uh, seeing none, we'll see if there's any public comment on the item. There's no public comment, President Costa. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our constituency group reports. And uh, we have a report from the Academic uh, Senate. With that, I will uh, welcome Mr. Stewart. Good afternoon, President Costa and Vice President Aguinaldo and Calbright board members. This is the first time that Calbright uh, Academic Senate is in front of you this calendar year. Uh, we have some reports for what we have finished last year and what we're working on this year. I will read the reports out and highlight our faculty and in no particular order. So first we'll start with the instructional faculty. Uh, your instructional faculty has co-authored an article that was featured in the Academic Senate uh, the state ASCCC <laughs> Paul Rostrum. Uh, this is the first time that Calbright faculty has been published. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, the faculty is also participating in the resolutions committee for the ASCCC. So we felt that as a faculty body, we should make a presence, jump in feet first, and contribute so that they know that Calvite is ready to roll up their sleeves and go to work with them. And we have been accepted and they love the work that we're doing with them. Another great accomplishment for our faculty is um, the collaboration with the learning instruction administrators to develop and codify an improved curriculum approval and review process. And the faculties are participating in a proactive student outreach to help increase student progression through our programs. On to the counseling faculties, or faculty, sorry. Uh, we have participated in student outreach uh, campaign, and I'm happy to report that 45% of the students that were 14 to 29 days of no academic activity, and 35% of those students who had no academic activity between 35 and 45 days have re-engaged within the three weeks of outreach from our counseling faculty. And that's really big props to them. They put in a lot of work and called a lot of students to get that happening. <clears throat> um, on to our programs now, our medical program, medical coding, uh, our peer, peer mentoring and tutoring is progressing well. Our pilot program, which is the data analysis program, uh, has surpassed the goal of 41 students completing the first course and there are 49 students moving on to the real world project section and four students have completed the entire program within the last four months, within four months, sorry. Next, we have a report from our WF500, which is the Essentials 21 uh, Century Skills course. Several students have submitted assignments and the responses are very thoughtful and, uh, and they demonstrate vital career readiness concepts, meaning working on their resumes, uh, forward thinking about 
interviews and other things that come with completing that course. And now for the big, what we call the behemoth courses, our IT 500 and our IT 510, we have gone through reconstruction of those two courses. And I'm very happy to say that our both of those courses have now launched, are up and running. We've worked through a lot of the bugs, cleaned them up. So we had another iteration upon that. But students are taking advantage of our new CPL, which is our credit for prior learning features in the programs. We've developed pre-assessments so that students can take that pre-assessment. If they score 80% or higher, they can move forward. So this is our first established CBE courses that we have. And because of that, we've seen students matriculate through those programs a lot faster than the original courses that we have. So unfortunately, the students had to restart the course in IT 510 and IT 500 because of this implementation. Not anything to do with us, but the third party LMS that we were using to deliver the uh, content with. But because of the outreach that our counseling faculty did and our instructional faculty also did, and the fact that we implemented the new labs and the new features, the students saw this as an enhanced version and an enhanced feature, and they were happy to start again because they were learning new material that was new, exciting, and had the lab features that incorporated hands-on experience for them. So that was a, a great success for our faculty. Uh, next, we have IT 520 and IT 525, which is our CRM course. And it is still going strong. It's successfully featuring content and student-led exam preparation sessions. And students are matriculating through that course at a great pace. Once again, CalBytes faculty is working hard to support our students. And with the support from our VPs and our administrators, we're finding that we're now working in collaboration and we're now truly affecting the students in a positive way that we are, we're excited and be proud of. That is all that we have for the Academic Senate. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you so much for your report. I, I don't show that we have any other constituency group reports today. Um, He's looking at a question. But oh, um, well, constituency reports, we don't do. Yeah, we don't do questions during this, actually. I mean, I appreciate it, but um, it's actually not part of our structure. Um, uh, with that, we move on to public forum. Are there any members of the public who wish to be heard? There is no public comment, President Costa. All right, with that, thank you, colleagues. We are adjourned. The business of the Board of Trustees is now complete. Thank you for your participation. <laughs> 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 report very talented presentation. Right? No. Exactly.